Hi! <laughs> Welcome to an adventure. Uh, today we're exploring the Bailey Law Collection on episode number 19 of Archival Adventures. Um, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, a community collections archivist here at Virginia Tech. And yes, I am reading from a prompter. That is my phone in front of me because it makes it so that I don't forget what I'm going to say. Um, before we begin, I just have a couple of acknowledgments that I wanted to make. Um, it's a regular thing that I do on this program. Um, I want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. Uh, I pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Uh, further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children uh, on this land. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So uh, today's program is going to be focusing on the Bailey Law Collection. Um, I can share a little bit about that collection with you and then we will start looking uh, at that stuff. Let me see. I've got screen share ready. There we go. Um, so. If you've not been here before, this is the Virginia Heritage website. Um, it's hosted by the University of Virginia, but it's where our finding aids are located. And this, what I have on the screen right now, is the finding aid for the Bailey Law Collection. Um, this is a collection that covers the period from 1825 to 1971. And um, you can see the collection number there, MS 1982-002, which is really just an inventory number. It doesn't really give you a lot of useful information. But um, we'll read the abstract, and then I think we'll read the biographical information about the two individuals who compiled the collection. Uh, so this collection is the papers of ornithologists John Eugene Law and Harold H. Bailey including notes on bird species, habitat, and behavior, correspondence, field journals, printed materials, photographs, and other images. Among Bailey's papers are files relating to his books, The Birds of Virginia and The Birds of Florida, as well as his operation of the Rockbridge Alum Springs Biological Laboratory, or sorry, Rockbridge Alum Springs Biological Laboratory. It also includes biographical files on hundreds of other naturalists and ornithologists, including such materials as correspondence, writings, photographs, field notes, and biographical sketches. So a little biographical information about uh, Bailey and Law, who this collection is named for primarily because they're the ones that compiled it, and it is their papers. Um, John Eugene Law, son of John and Catherine E. Law, was born in Forest City, Iowa on August 26, 1877. After graduating from high school in Perry, Iowa, Law attended the University of Wisconsin and Stanford University, obtaining an A.B. in 1900. I am not familiar with what an A.B. is. Hi, Hannah. Welcome in. Um, if anybody does know what an A, B is as far as a degree, please feel free to pop that in chat because I'm not familiar with that one. Um, he held a series of bank positions in Pomona and Hollywood, California for the next several years before retiring from business in 1914. In 1919, he joined the California Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. 
paid one dollar a year, Law served first as a curator of osteology and later as a curator in uh, tillology. So osteology, that's going to be like the study of skeletons, I believe. Um, but I'm not familiar with what tillology is. Let me see if I can find out what tillology is for us before we move on. Uh, Oh, okay. So, as far as I can tell, it's not actually anything. It is a proposed name for the study of the plumage of birds. But I can't see that it's actually been agreed upon as the name for that study. But regardless, uh, Tillology would be the study of bird plumage, and osteology, just confirming, the study of the structure and function of the skeleton and bony structures. Um, so he was curator of both osteology and uh, bird plumage. I still don't know what an AB degree is, but that's okay. Just a, ba a Bachelor of the Arts, is that what, that's what you think, key squared? Okay, that would, I suppose, make sense. Also, welcome, thank you for stopping by. Um, though, he construct, uh, though he conducted considerable research, particularly in California and the Chiricahua Mountains of Arizona, uh, published a number of papers and amassed a sizable collection of specimens, a great portion of Law's time was devoted to administrative duties for the Western Bird Banding Association, and to a greater extent, the Co Cooper Ornithological Club. He joined the COC in 1900 and would hold several key positions, Southern Division President in 1905 uh, and 1913 to 1915, Vice President 1916 to 1917, Secretary 1906 to 1912, Business Manager 1907 to 1925, President and Board of Governors, or President of the Board of Governors in 1925. Uh, Law married Laura Maudlin Be uh, Beatty in Los Angeles on January 20, 1915. Sharing an interest in ornithology, the couple often performed field work together, especially in bird banding. John Eugene Law died on November 14, 1931. In 1937, Laura Beatty Law married another ornithologist, Harold Bailey. Born in East Orange, New Jersey on October 13, 1878, Harold Harris Bailey was the son of Harold Balsh Bailey and Lily Adams Taylor. As a child, Bailey moved with his parents to Newport News, Virginia, and in 1906 he married Ida Margaret Eschenberg. Bailey worked as a naval architect and shipbroker, perhaps while living in California, then returned to Newport News. He served four years as game inspector for Virginia and Maryland before resigning in 1918 to devote all of his time to the management of his farm on the James River in Virginia. Meanwhile, inheriting an interest in ornithology from his father, Bailey had published The Birds of Virginia in 1913. Bailey moved with his wife and children to Miami, Florida, where he worked with the Bureau of Biological Survey and published The Birds of Florida in 1925. During his years in Florida, Bailey was instrumental in the establishment of the Everglades National Park. In 1937, Bailey married Laura Beatty Law, oh, sorry, tripping over words. In 1937, Bailey married Laura Beatty Law, and the couple in 1942 moved with their extensive collection to Goshen, Virginia, where they renovated the abandoned Rockbridge Alum Springs Mineral Spa and established the Rockbridge Alum Springs Biological Laboratory. In 1961, Bailey established the Bailey Research Trust, later the Bailey Wildlife Foundation. Following Harold Bailey's death on July 24, 1962, Laura Bailey oversaw curatorial duties for the collection and presented it to Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University in 1969. She died in Lexington, Virginia on September 18, 1975. So, 
this is a really extensive collection. And we don't even have all of the original collection here anymore. Um, oh, so according to what Hannah found, AB is the abbreviation for Artium Baccalaureus, which is the Latin name for the Bachelor of Arts degree, which I think is the same thing that Key Squared was saying over on the other channel. Um, but thank you both. So, um, the collection includes uh, a significant amount of correspondence, some subject files containing mostly handwritten notes um, concerning bird species behavior and ph physiology, uh, research and field work, and same, f let's see, that's for the law papers. For the Bailey papers, again, correspondence, field and research work, subject files, publications, Rockbridge Alum Springs, Naturalist biological files, biological? Biographical files. Um, there's actually an extensive autograph collection in, included in here. Um, I did not pull everything because there are, I believe, 32 boxes and I only had one cart. So I pulled a lot of the more visual material for today. Um, but we can always return to this if people find it more interesting. I actually could do a second week on this collection very easily. Um, under related material, this is one of the first collections that I've pulled where related material is actually rather important to look at. Um, so books from the Bailey Law Collection are actually going to be found in our Rare Books Collection not in this manuscript collection. So we've got 32 boxes of manuscript materials, but then there were dozens of books as well that went into our rare books collection and are listed separately in our catalog. But also, the extensive collection of bird skins, bird eggs, and mammal skins amassed by Law and Bailey were given to Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University's Department of Biology in 1969. In 1990, the collection was transferred to the Virginia Tech branch of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. And when the branch closed in 2003, most of the collection was transferred to the Virginia Museum of Natu Natural History in Martinsville. The remainder was retained by Virginia Tech's Department of Biology. So there were actually skins, eggs, and mammal skins, as well as bird nests um, that were part of this collection originally and that we no longer have because they went to the Museum of Natural History instead. Um, there is a blog post that I did back in 2017 about this collection, very brief, um, but it is out there on our Special Collections blog if you're so interested. Um, there were a couple I thought there was one or two things. Ah, so linked in here is actually, um, so the actual like specimens uh, were of interest to the Department of Biology. They were not something that Special Collections and University Archives is really set up to house because um, we're not a museum. We are a place that deals with documents. So in, instead of coming to us when the collection was transferred to the library, that stuff went to the Museum of Natural History. Um, what I found really interesting is in 2014, some of the museum staff from the Museum of Natural History came here to Virginia Tech to actually look through the papers in this collection to learn more about the specimens that they had been given. Um, and they have a blog post called A Visit to the Bailey Law Special Collection um, that they created at that time talking about the collection and their experience uh, coming here to see it. Um, so there's stuff out there on the blog if you're so interested. There's also some images from the collection available in our image-based database. Um, and then there's one more person that I felt would be important to kind of give some biography on before we dive in, and that is the artist who did the art 
for Bailey's books. Um, and that person is George Mitch Sutton. Um, I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce the middle name. I, it just looks like Mitch to me. But uh, George Sutton was an American ornithologist and bird artist. He published numerous technical papers in ornithology, as well as more popular works illustrated with his own art. His early artistic work was inspired and tutored by uh, Luis Fuertes. In 1931, he was the first ornithologist to find the eggs of the Harris's sparrow, one of the last North American birds to have its nest and eggs described. In 1935, he was part of the team of Arthur Allen during an expedition to the Stinger Tract in Louisiana to make sketches of ivory-billed woodpecker. He did extensive fieldwork in the Arctic, including Iceland, uh, Oklahoma, Labrador, and Mexico. He received his doctorate from Cornell and held academic posts at the University of Michigan and the University of Oklahoma. Um, and there is a research center in Oklahoma named after him. So he is the ornithologist who actually did the watercolor art that we will see today. Um, and I thought it would be good to just kind of cover him since we didn't get his biography in the description of the collection itself. Uh, okay. Yeah, give credit to the artist whenever it is at all possible. He is mentioned in the finding aid. Um, in a couple of spots, but uh, I honestly didn't even notice that it was a separate artist until I was seeing his signature on the art itself. Um, because I'm used to like Audubon and, oh, sorry, I have the wrong scene up. You're all seeing Into the Matrix. Um, <laughs> there, that's better. Um, I'm used to John James Audubon who did his own art um, or in some cases, I believe his son did some of the art to finish out the work he was doing. But um, yeah, I'm used to Audubon where it wasn't a separate artist. And in this case, it is definitely a separate artist who was also an ornithologist. But I did pull a number of items uh, here on this cart. If there is something in the collection you're interested in seeing, please um, let me know. I believe the finding aid has been posted in at least one of the chats. Um, Kira or Alice, if you could also post the finding aid to the other channel, that would be great. If you see something listed in the finding aid that you're particularly interested in seeing, let me know. If it's in one of the boxes I have here, I will pull it out and we can see it. Um, if it's not, I will make a note of it and we will look at it next week. So, the first folder in this first box, so right now I have box 13, um, and the very first folder in here is just labeled mammal skins, and I am uncertain what we will find. I know it will not be actual samples of mammal skin. That would have been the stuff that went to the Museum of Natural History. So I'm a little curious to see what's in this folder. Let me make it so you can see the documents. Right, so we have folder. Let's see what's in it. Some handwritten notes, it appears. Got messing with the setup here just a tiny bit. Um, Extra mammal skins for exchange is the title of this document. So interesting. Um, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit and make it so that you all might be able to read along with me. So this would have been um, a list of specimens available for other people to add to their 
collection. This would all be for scientific study. All right. I think that's as good as we're going to get. I do have the little light on. <coughs> so 14 gray squirrel skins, northern from Long Island. Nearly all with skulls. Uh, five gray squirrel, gray squirrel skins southern from Virginia plus skulls. 17 southern without the skull. Interesting. I wasn't expecting to talk about uh, squirrels and let's see, we've got Groundhogs and wood rats, muskrats, eastern flying squirrels, eastern moles, chipmunks, pocket gopher. So a, a list of um, mammal specimens that apparently was available for other scientists. It actually continues on to the back. Reusing, recycling some paper. Here there's a, looks like a, oh, it's a copy of the ad for the birds of, uh, the birds of Florida um, that has been <coughs> repurposed. Eastern cottontails, marsh rabbits, Not certain what this is. Red-headed mouse. Meadow mouse. So, yeah. Continuing that list. What do we have here? Oh, another list. Actually, I believe this is just a typed up version of the same list. Mr. H. H. Bailey. Dear Mr. Bailey, we have laid out and carefully gone over the mammals received from you and find much of interest therein. We have listed them as follows. Uh, Scalopus blarina, Lascurius, Glaucomus. So these are just the like scientific names. Um, Looks like a total of 193 that they could catalog. Uh, 154 they could not because they had skins with defective skulls. And 92 that they could not catalog because it was the skin alone. And that's from the University of California Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley. A couple copies of this list. All right. Well, I was not expecting that, um, especially since the main main focus of today is birds. So we have got a folder here of Birds of Florida Incoming Correspondence, 1924 to 1947, A through F. Um, A through F, I believe, is going to refer to the name of the sender. And we'll just look at some of this. Um, there's actually quite a lot of correspondence here. This is about the uh, Bailey's publication, The Birds of Florida, which I have a copy of and we will look at shortly. Um, specialize, let's see, I. C. Adams, Jr., specializing in books of natural history and related subjects, books new and used, stamps, coins, and guns. Harold H. Bailey, dear Mr. Bailey, enclosed, please find my check for $36.25 to cover the cost of five copies of the Birds of Florida. These were received in good shape. Thanks. 
As a member of the Cooper Ornithological Club, I was interested in your regarding same. In your re-regarding same. I did not know such things were going on and was glad to learn of them. Sincerely, I.C. Adams, Jr. Interestingly enough, this is a copy of the Birds of Florida. Let me make this bigger for you. So this is the, the book. Hardcover, nice folio size, um, includes lithographed watercolor prints. $36.25 was enough for five copies of this book in, uh, oh, it doesn't have a date on it, but it, it would have been in like the 1940s, I believe. Oh, yeah, 28 February 1947. Oh, I just closed the thing that lets me change scenes. One second. There we go. All right. You all should be able to see the document again. American Nature Association. Publishers of Nature Magazine. Washington, D.C. Mr. Harold H. Bailey, Professional Building, Miami, Florida. Dear Mr. Bailey, or my, sorry, it says my, my dear Mr. Bailey. Our records show that under date of May 24th, a copy of the June issue in which appeared a review of your book, Birds of Florida, was forwarded to you. Possibly it has reached you by this time, but in the event that it may have miscarried, I am having a second copy forwarded to you today. Please be sure to let me know if both, or, if both of these should happen to Miss Carey. Very sincerely yours, Robert W. Westwood, Assistant Editor. So apparently, if you look at the uh, June issue of the American Nature magazine from 1926, there was a review of Birds of Florida. So if I was particularly researching Bailey or his publication, that would be a place to look for additional information. Um, the Beck Engraving Company, designers, engravers, printers, Philadelphia. Dear Sir, we have your letter of May 26th. This is, again, 1924 this time. The cost of making 80 sets of four-color process plates of birds, size of plates to be 10 and a half inches by 7 and a half inches, would be approximately $200 per set. Somebody has penciled in on here 16,000. Um, I am uncertain who has done that, when it was done, uh, but my guess is that that was an attempt to update that number of $200, because $200 in 1924 would have been a lot of money. Um, we would be able to give you an exact figure on these if we could see several of the originals. We would not care to undertake the work unless we also printed the plates for you. I know that the sheets on which they will be printed will be 11, and, 11 by 8 and a half inches. We will give you an exact estimate on the printing if you will let us know the quality desired. That copy of American Nature magazine has been digitized for 1925 and 1927, but not yet for 1926. Oh. Amazing. I don't even, I, I don't know that we have a copy of it here even. Um, we will give an exact estimate on the printing if you will let us know the quality, quantity desired. In reference to our ability to handle this work satisfactorily as to quality, we can refer you to the Lewis 
uh, a Louis um, Agassiz Fuertes, the bird artist who lives at Cornell Heights, Ithaca, New York, and who made the bird drawings for the National Geographic magazine. We can also refer you Oh, we can also refer you to the National Geographic magazine. Uh, you are familiar, no doubt, with the book of birds that we engraved and printed for them. We might say in connection with this printing that your work would look better for the reason that you would use a better and heavier grade of stock than it is possible for the Geographic to use. The color work for the bird book was printed at the same time we printed the inserts for the magazine, which work is printed from electrotypes uh, from the original plates on a fairly lightweight enamel paper, whereas your original plates are on a fairly, sorry, whereas your work would be printed from original plates on a heavy paper. We can refer you also to Mr. Elwer, El, Mr. Edward Bach, Mountain Lake, Florida, who I believe is very much interested in birds. We have also reproduced considerable work for the Carnegie Institute, Washington. Uh, we can assure you that if you entrust the work to us, it will be done to your entire satisfaction, both as to quality and price. Yours very truly, the Beck Engraving Company. Signed by the treasurer, whose name I can't make out just from the signature. But So there's a lot of letters in here about the publication of the Birds of Florida, <clears throat> in fact, as I noted before, this is an entire folder full of letters and correspondence about the birds of Florida. Uh, you can kind of see how thick that folder is there, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and it is the first of three folders of incoming correspondence and then there is a folder of outgoing correspondence, all of which are about this thick. <coughs> um, there's financial records, specifications and notes, promotional material, which could be interesting, some sales contracts, Birds of Virginia sales book, Birds of Virginia promotional material, Yeah, we'll look at the promotional material for the two books. Um, <coughs> see how that comes across. Birds of Florida are put in book. Harold H. Bailey gives public benefit of five years of intensive study. The Birds of Florida now have a book all their own. Harold H. Bailey, whose home is in Alhambra Circle, Coral Gables, has put the results of five years' intensive study into an interesting volume, The Bird Life of Florida, which is attracting wide attention not only from scientists, but from the general reader. <coughs> Although a shipbroker, Mr. Bailey has given a greater part of his time for the past five years going over the state, collecting his material. The book is enriched with 76 full-page four-color plates, the color plates are reproductions from watercolors by George M. Sutton, one of America's foremost bird artists. Typical Florida scenery provides a colorful background for the drawings and depicts the natural habitats of the feathered family. There are 425 species and subspecies of birds that are now or have been found within the state. The book is the first ever published on Florida bird life. It is more interesting to this section, perhaps, than to any other section of, uh, of Florida from a personal interest point of view. For it was to the late Mary Barr Monroe, who lived in Coconut Grove and Elizabeth Carr uh, Gratigny, a Miami woman, that the book is dedicated. Both women were prominent in their efforts to stimulate interest in bird life and for the protection of the birds, Another local touch is the use of the poem To the Buzzing Swining in Silence. This was written by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas of Miami and is thought to be one of her best. It is incorporated into the pages prepared on the scavenger bird types. Scientists who have seen Mr. Bailey's book have declared it to be a valuable contribution to bird lore, 
Copies have been obtained by the county for every public school library. <coughs> Mr. Bailey has been most painstaking in his collection of facts and has made important contributions to our knowledge of bird habits. Take the case of the hawk and the butcher birds, which are natives of the north and have been studied as such. Their habits, Mr. Bailey discloses, are quite different when they are in Florida. The abundance of insect life in this country provides them with sufficient food, and they do not resort to the, sm to the smaller animals as a source of supply while in this state. Such conclusions as this were reached when scientific ex examinations were made of the stomachs of the birds. Besides being of interest to bird lovers, Mr. Bailey's book is valuable for the knowledge it contains on the habits of the birds. <clears throat> Considering from the economic viewpoint, it is useful for the foods of each species has been studied to determine the beneficial and injurious birds to our state. Mr. Bailey has always been a naturalist. In Virginia, where he lived before he came to Florida, he did a similar work for that state and published Birds of Virginia. <clears throat> before going to Virginia, where he spent 14 years in research work, he carried on similar study in California. He's a member of the CO. C-O-C-W-O-C-A-M-S-M-T-S-N-H and a number of other societies dedicated to the naturalist's interest. <laughs> it does not clarify what those letters stand for. C-O-C-W-O-C-A-M-S-M-T-S-N-H which is apparently an abbreviation for something. <clears throat> Mr. Bailey was assisted in assembling his material in book form by Mrs. Bailey, who is an active worker in the Women's Club and interested in other Miami, Miami Beach, and Coral Gables clubs and circles. She is a devoted gard gardener, as is Mr. Bailey, and the grounds surrounding their home are interesting for the many curious specimens of plant life. They have four charming children, Dorothy is active in sports, while Miss Betty, a high school student, is a popular member of the Coral Gables student set. Merritt, a sturdy youngster of 13, and it, it continues on. I'm not going to finish reading it because it moves to another page. So these are photocopies of newspaper articles that were in here. Let's see what else I've got. <clears throat> the Library Journal. Four different organizations. Oh, there were commas. I didn't, I did not see the commas, Hannah. I only saw letter, period, letter, period, letter, period. So, COC, WOC, AM, SM, TSNH. So, one, two, three, four, actually five abbreviations, but still not super useful unless you're familiar with them. <coughs> Let's see, what am I looking for here? This appears to be... <laughs> so, I have the cover of the January 1st, 1926 issue of the Library Journal. <coughs> but, that's it. It's just the cover. Inserted into it was a copy of advertising text for the birds of Florida. Oh, sorry, getting a note here. Um. <coughs> 
So this was uh, the text for an ad that went into the library journal. Librarians, have you seen that handsome and instructive book? One moment. That's not what it says. I mean, look at the proof. That is very interesting. So, what, what is actually printed on this page is librarians. Have you seen that handsome and instructive boy key to the birds of Florida? Um, which is not what was intended by that sentence. Um, since BOI, as a reference to young males, was definitely not in use in 1926. Um, the actual like proof from the library journal of what was going to be printed, it starts out, librarians, have you seen that handsome and instructive color key to the birds of Florida? For the last few years, attention has been focused upon Florida, and half of the world has been traveling thither to investigate the conditions as reported there. Bird life, as one of the state's great assets, has not been overlooked. For the purpose of stimulating study by accurate identification, the 76 full-page four-color plates have proven a positive boon. Visitors are surprised to find that a large percentage of the birds seen in Florida during the winter are, like themselves, migrants, and may, many may be identified as having come from their home state, especially if east of the Rockies. So the book is valuable outside of the state to a great extent. The work is illustrated with 486 figures on 79 9-inch by 12-inch full-page four-color plates, which is also the size of the text page. There is a line drawing map of the state showing areas mentioned and the topography of a bird. The colored plates are reproductions from watercolor drawings made by one of America's foremost bird artists, George M. Sutton, with backgrounds depicting natural habitats. The text is on 70 pound rag paper. The colored plates on Dylan Collins's black and white. While the cover is the well-known Mal Malloy make stamped in gold. <clears throat> Those interested in the economic side of bird life will find it especially useful, for the food of each species has been carefully studied to find out whether the bird is beneficial or injurious to our state. The book is ready for delivery. The price is $20 delivered to you while they last. Do not delay. Interesting that in 1926, the library cost for this book was $20, but we had a note from around the same time frame in the correspondence mentioning that they got five copies for $32. <laughs> yeah, key squared. I don't think that's what they had in mind, but that is what was printed. <coughs> Pardon me. From an earlier time, there was the Birds of Virginia. The Birds of Florida was the second volume he did. This is an ad for the birds of Virginia. What is being said of the birds of Virginia? Uh, it gives information to contact opinions. Ellison A. Smythe Jr. Actually, I think it's just Ellison A. Smith Jr. Um, head of the Department of Biology, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, in reviewing the book in the Siwani Review says, a notable book of the season from a Southern publisher is The Birds of Virginia by Harold H. Bailey. The book deals with only those birds known to breed within the limits of the state. 185 species are treated, the range of each species, its nesting habits, oological details such as size and number of eggs, their color and markings are carefully given. 
There are also many notes on the general habits of the birds and little touches here and there that show the love and nature and that show the love of nature and of bird life to be a prominent trait in the author's character. The absence of dry scientific detail commends the book to the lay student of birds. The book covers the results of about 24 years field experience in Virginia, while the author has studied bird life also in California and other western states and in the tropics. The volume is beautifully illustrated with 14 full-page color drawings and 108 excellent halftones taken from nature of birds, nests, nesting sites, and, len uh, sorry, and general views. The printing and illustrations, the letterpress, binding, and general appearance of the book reflect great credit upon the publishers, and the whole may be considered as a distinct achievement for the South as well as a valuable and helpful contribution to the study of our Southern bird life. So, more positive reviews there because this little flyer is an advertisement for the book, trying to get people to buy it. I think most of what we're going to look at today is going to be these two books uh, because they're kind of neat. Let me see here. Um, I don't know if the library edition was fancier or not, Hannah. It's entirely possible. How about we start with The Birds of Virginia. Do, 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 do. Zooming out. So this is a copy of Harold H. Bailey's The Birds of Virginia. It's a lovely little cover, green with illustration of birds on it. Um, this is published by J.P. Bell Company Incorporated. And it was published in 1913. And right here at the very beginning, we get our first color illustration, the brown-headed nuthatch. So The Birds of Virginia by Harold H. Bailey with 14 full-page colored plates, one map, and 108 halftones taken from nature. Treating 185 species and subspecies, all the birds that breed within the state. 1913, J.P. Bell Company Incorporated Publishers, Lynchburg, Virginia. For over 40 years, he has been an active bird lover and student, and the boyish enthusiasm he still displays is an incentive for me to follow in his footsteps. To my father, I dedicate this book. So if there is a bird that you might particularly be interested in, do let me know and I will see if it is in this book um, <coughs> or in the Birds of Florida and we can take a look at it. Same as kind of what we did with the trees last week. Otherwise, let me see here. I'm going to just... There's a, some preface information here. In presenting the birds of Virginia to the public, the author had two objectives in view. Since the days of Audubon and Wilson, many ornithologists have paid short visits to our state, their notes appearing in various magazines and papers from time to time. To date, however, there has never been published any thorough, systematic work on our breeding birds and feeling the need of such a volume as a checklist by the advanced ornithologists of our country, the author commenced this work some six years ago. 
On the other hand, he has tried to present his accumulation of data in such shape as to be of interest to those who only come in contact with our native birds from time to time and so stimulate interest along this line. It seems strange that there should be so few bird lovers in our state considering its size and the great amount of bird life there has always been here. Resident bird students have, however, always been scarce and in little or no interest shown in the welfare of the birds. And little or no interest shown in the welfare of the birds. This book only treats of those birds which are known to breed within the limits of our state, though many other species winter with us and remain for a short time during their migrations northward and southward each spring and fall. If my ornithological friends find it of help as a reference or in any way, it should help to promote interest in the native birds throughout our state. I will feel amply repaid for the time spent upon it. HHB, Newport News, Virginia, March 15, 1913. I'm going to skip over the introduction. Get some nest photography. Here we have Cabo's turn. I'm going to switch this so that I can read it, but then also make it so that you can see it right side up, maybe? Yes, there we go. Um, Cabo's turn. Sterna sandvicensis, sand, yes. Sterna sandvicensis acuflavida. Range North and South America, breeds from Virginia to Florida, Texas and Mexico, winters from the Bahamas, Florida, and Louisiana to Central America, both coasts, the Greater Antilles, Colombia, and Brazil, accidental in Ontario, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and the Lesser Antilles. This is an extremely rare bird on our coast. And it was not until the summer of 1912 that a set of two eggs of this species was secured from one of our coastal islands. As there has been a small colony of these birds breeding on the North Carolina coast for the last few years, the birds with us are probably stragglers from that colony. The eggs were laid in a slight depression in the sandy beach, well back from the ordinary high tide line. They have a boldy, bold creamy ground, streaked with blotched streaked and blotched with heavy markings of blackish brown with lighter shade markings of lavender. Size 2.12 by 1.42. They probably arrive and depart with the other large terns, such as the Royal and Caspian. I hope these birds will continue to breed with us, for while they are very common further south, they are a rarity and a novelty with us. Besides helping to beautify our bays and shores by their presence, they raise but a single brood each season with us. So, nice little illustration. This book um, is a lot more text heavy than the birds of Florida. And a lot of the illustrations are these small black and white plates. This is a typical nesting site of the common tern. And so I'm not sure how well you can make it out. Um, there's a lot of like, uh, there's sandy ground, a couple of driftwood sticks, some straw, which makes up the nest. And then in the very center there, there are, it looks like four eggs. <coughs> I'm gonna skip a little bit further. Here we have the wild turkey. Let's see if I can zoom in a bit. Get that a little more centered in the screen for you. Maybe. Also, I'm not certain who did the illustrations for this book. I will have to check on that in a moment. Um, family 
Meliagridae turkeys, genus Meliagris. Meliagris Galapavo sylvestris, wild turkey. Range, eastern United States from Nebraska, Kansas, western Oklahoma, and eastern Texas, east to central Pennsylvania, and south to the Gulf Coast. Formerly north to South Dakota, southern Ontario, and southern Maine. This truly magnificent bird, notwithstanding its continual depleted flocks by shooting and trapping, is still with us, but cannot long stand the conditions now taking place in our state, unless something is done shortly for its protection. The large timber throughout our area is rapidly being cut off, and afterwards, with the remaining woods full of dead tops and limbs, follows the fire sweeping everything before it and practically making this a barren land for five or six years to come. During the last six years, there has also been a steady increase in our section of farming lands being cleared and cultivated, while the new methods of farming leave little food or cover on the cultivated lands during the winter season. These two great factors, with necessarily more persons gunning for them, is rapidly extinguishing those, these noble birds and pushing them further westward from our coastline. They are not a migratory bird, and one flock will inhabit a piece of woods and swampland continuously if unmolested, or if not nearly exterminated. The practice of trapping them in pens and shooting them while roosting in the trees at night has done much to decrease their numbers. The nest is a slight hollow stretched in the ground at the base of a tree or under some sheltering bushes lined with dry leaves and a few feathers from the turkey's breast after incubation commences. The ground color is a rich buff, specked and spotted with reddish brown. Uh, fresh eggs April 15th, 9 to 14 in number. Some 15 years ago, it was no uncommon sight to see an old pair with quarter or half-grown young dusting themselves in our more than dusty country roads, but with changed roads and other conditions, this is ra a rare sight nowadays and becoming more so as the years roll by. They raise only one brood a season, they are a hardy bird, and, dry, and during a dry season like that of the summer of 1911 and 12, hatch and raise nearly their entire setting. It is now becoming quite a practice with farmers all over the country to cross a wild turkey gobbler with their domesticated flock, thus infusing hardiness into their stock. Many states are also introducing them as game birds, later, as their numbers increase, to be shot for sport and food. This means a propagation will probably save them from possible extinction. Their food consists of beech nuts, uh, chinkapins, and other acorns, wild berries and grapes, insects, grasshoppers, beetles, etc. Let's see what we can find here. Here we have the summer tanager. And I'm actually going to zoom out so you can see the whole page because this page has some interesting um, insect work on it. If I can get the zoom to go and do what I want it to. So, as you can see down here at the bottom of the page, there are these cuts in the pages. Um, and those are actually insect activity. Um, I talk about them in the blog that I did. Let me find the details. Um, so, I did some research just based on the shape and type of scoring in this book. You can actually see it even on the front cover. There are two holes in, in the front cover of the book. Um, and then you can kind of follow the damage through the book. It starts as just those single holes um, and then eventually grows out into this larger sections. Um, 
so various spots, and then there are actually three holes on the back cover. And from the research that I did based on the shape of the holes themselves, um, this is probably larval Anobium uh, punctatum, or another similar beetle. Um, Anobium punctatum is the common furniture beetle, or common house borer. Um, it is what is referred to as, it is one of many insects that are collectively referred to as a bookworm. Uh, so this is what happens when a bookworm uh, gets to your book. And in this case, from the research that I did, it looked like this was probably the Anobium punctatum, or common furniture beetle. Um, but over on the right side, the actual illustration in the book is a summer tanager, or a summer red bird. Range is southeastern United States and northern South America. Breeds in Carolinian and Astro... Breeds in Carolinian and Austroaparian zones from southeastern Nebraska, southern Iowa, southeastern Wisconsin, central Indiana, southern Ohio, Maryland, formerly New Jersey, and Delaware, south to northeastern Mexico and central Florida. Winters from central Mexico and Yucatan to Ecuador, Peru, and Guyana. Stragglers north to New Brunswick, Quebec, Nova Scotia, Maine, and Ontario. Migrant in western Cuba, accidental in the Bahamas. I don't understand what it means by accidental. I think it just means that they're extremely rare in those areas. Um, I enjoy learning about birds, and, but I haven't formally studied any sort of ornithology, so if that is like a common um, actual like jargon term for the range of birds in ornithology, it, it, I'm not familiar with that because I haven't studied that type of jargon in depth. Um, a beautiful bird, especially the male, but a lazy pair when it comes down to nest building. Seldom is it that you can't walk among some path on the edge of a piece of woods, or that bordering the main country road and or that bordering the main country road and look up through a flimsy made nest of these birds and see the eggs. In this respect, they may be classed with the morning dove and the green heron. Don't misjudge these remarks and think you can go along any road or path and see nests easily. For they are, they are not an overcommon bird with us, though suitable localities seldom fare to, fail to have their single pair. The casual observer is apt to confuse them with the cardinal, especially during the breeding season, on account of the height of the nest, often not six, in, out, bleh, often not six feet from the ground. The nest is placed on the crotch of a lower limb of a tree, an oak, dogwood, or pine, Generally, three to four eggs is a complete set with us. A pale bluish green spotted and botched with reddish brown. Fresh eggs May 20th to June 12th. They do not winter with us. Nest composed of fine straws or grasses, loosely made or woven together. Only one brood a season. The spring migratory birds reach us about April 17th and depart southward August 5th to 8th. <clears throat> Their song is uttered from the treetops, seldom when in close proximity to the nest or ground, and is rather pleasing to the ear, though it never varies, being confined to three notes, and a short stanza similar to the red-eyed uh, vireo. Long distances are made in search of food and nesting material, the male following his mate back and forth while nest building is going on. While they are not an abundant bird with us, still the amount of food taken from the higher foliage such as caterpillars, beetles, and larvae, must be reckoned with and places them in the beneficial list. Single pairs are scattered sparingly over our whole area. <coughs> so 
So it's a lovely little book, the, the Birds of Virginia. A lot of descriptive text, and definitely I can see how this is more geared towards the general public than the strict scientific nature. Um, last week when we were looking at the American woods, that was clearly much more scientific in approach. This gives some scientific detail, but seems like it's meant f more broadly. Um, and that may just be that ornithology has a history of being a side pursuit rather than somebody's main study. Um, it's very common for a lot of the big names in ornithology to have been somebody who did something else and studied birds on the side. Um, before we look at the birds of Florida, I want to pull out box 25A. <laughs> this is a box that is actually labeled on the front, caution. This box is heavier than it appears. Um, there are a couple of these boxes, and they are indeed heavier than they appear. <laughs> uh, Leadbird, uh, you'll see, you'll see. <clears throat> so these boxes are full of metal plates. Oh, that one doesn't really have much of an image. Let me pull one of the others. So, this is the image. And this, next to it, is a very heavy metal printing plate for the image. Um, and we have the metal plates for the books. Uh, I believe these are for the birds of Florida. But I'm not 100% certain. Um, Kira or Alice, if you can look at the um, finding aid and tell me box 25A, if it's Birds of Florida or Birds of Virginia, that'd be great. I think it's Birds of Florida. We actually have multiple copies of this same plate. Um, see. I'm looking for another one. Here we go. Let's switch out and look at the next one now. So even these individual folders, the individual plates themselves, are quite heavy. Um, it's at least a couple of pounds for each plate. Uh, <laughs> but you can, you can sort of see on the metal plate the different, like the design. You can kind of make it out. Um, and then when inked, it, it produces the print that's here next to it. So this is the red cock, um, red cockaded woodpecker. <laughs> I think they're amazing. I don't know how they work to actually produce the different colors. Um, metal plate printing was definitely not something that I studied. But I, when I saw them, I was like, what are these boxes that are labeled caution? Boxes heavier than it appears. I need to see what's in there. And then when I did, I was like, these are the metal printing plates, like the original printing plates for this book. Um, so I thought it was really, really neat. 
I'm double checking here. Box 25. Come on, where are you? Okay, so box 25 A and D are the copper engraving plates for the Birds of Virginia. So the book that we were just looking at, these plates are related to that book. Should have a few more of them in here. Since there are multiple copies of each one, I don't know if I actually have the print of each one. Oh, this one's neat. Uh, I don't have the print that goes with it, so and I'm not sure you can see it. Oh, let me see if I can add some more light to it and see if that helps. Vaguely. No, it doesn't really help. All right, let me try and bring it closer to the lens. Maybe you can make it out. It's him, and he's covered in birds. I can try and find it in the book. I don't have a print with the um, with the plate. There was a listing of the big uh, of the images in here. I just have to find where that was. Index, 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 index. I don't know which one it is. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and I'm not going to spend forever searching for it. So we just get a plate of a man with a mustache holding some birds. And you can sort of see it. So th we've actually got, there are four boxes of these copper plates um, that are included. Let me see. So 25A through D are, yeah. Oof. Oof. But <laughs> we are at 346, and we only go until 430. I think I should show off the birds of Florida next. Covered in a layer of ink in whatever color needed, and the paper was printed with that color. The process was repeated for each color until you got the finished piece. So that's, um, that sounds similar to screen printing. Um, and it's entirely possible that that is how it's done. I'm just, I personally wasn't familiar. So that is a very similar process to screen printing, which I could totally believe. So this is the birds of Florida. Uh, show you on the big camera. The Birds of Florida is big. This is also the Birds of Florida. Much less big. <laughs> the difference being 
this is the original proof. This is the product that was sold. They are the same length. They have the same content. So why is one three times as thick? I'll show you. This one is three times as thick because it has the original watercolors in it. So, because it, it is a proof of the book. Um, I'm going to do this. I need to zoom out as far as I can, and I need to flip the image. Ha ha, there we go. Um, so each page in here, or each image in here, is an actual watercolor painting that has been pasted in to the book. So if I turn the page here, and we're, we're pushing the limits of what I can do with the camera that we have. Um, this is a, a camera designed for 8.5 by 11 pages. Um, and this book is definitely bigger than that. But so it's got this little like protective page between the text and the actual like painting. That is an actual watercolor painting. Uh, we are currently at page 14. So if I pull it over to page 14, we have the illustration here is um, the booby, the blue-faced booby, the gannet, the double-crested gannet up here, I think I got it on there, the red-faced booby up in the corner, the Mexican cormorant, Florida cormorant, no, the red-faced booby is this one. This is the Mexican cormorant up here, and this is the male, male and female, sorry, female up on top, male below of the Florida cormorant. And then it gives descriptions of each of the birds. Um, one that I would love to do, if I can find the right page. Ooh, there's the turkeys. Look at that picture of the turkeys. Let me pull to page 58 and actually tell you about these birds, because that's a pretty illustration. So in the lower left are the bobwhite, male and female. In the middle is the Florida wild turkey, female and male. And in the lower right is the Florida bobwhite, male and female. Family Odontophoridae, quail, bobwhites, etc. In our northern and western areas, the true form of the bobwhite is still found. But as we go southward, it overlaps with the subspecies Floridanus, and intergrades are found, gradually merging into the true Floridanus in the central and southern areas. This is also true of birds found on the extreme east coast. This, the northern bird, is a trifle larger and with a much more reddish plumage, but otherwise its general appearance, habits, food, and actions 
are similar to the Florida bobwhite, to which our reader is referred. Oh my gosh! <laughs> um, 16-bit Eric, I see you. Thank you for bringing over the whimsies. Um, let me go to, to face cam for a moment. Um, <laughs> welcome in, whimsies. It's good to see you all. Um, Today uh, is my archives stream and i um, doing a show called Archival Adventures. We're looking at the Bailey Law Collection, which is a collection of materials focused on um, ornithology. Uh, and uh, right now we're looking at a book called The Birds of Florida um, and just kind of having a nice time exploring what's in this ornithological collection. Uh, this month, Every Wednesday, I will be doing something ornithology or oology related. So, um, yeah, it's lovely to have you all come by. Um, this is a show that I do on two channels at the same time. So, I am streaming both to the VTUL Studios channel, which is the Virginia Tech University Libraries Studios, as well as uh, to my personal channel, uh, Rogan27. Um, and I'd love to have you stick around. Uh, we go for about another half an hour um, where we'll be looking at this material on birds. And then um, we will look to raid somewhere. We usually end up going over to the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium afterward. Uh, but yeah, Eric, it is so lovely to have you come by and bring the whimsies over. Um, I appreciate all of your support and uh, bringing over viewers. So. If you were watching and you don't already follow 16-Bit Eric, I encourage you to do so. Um, he's a fun streamer to follow and absolutely a wonderful human. So, I have to switch back. Uh, we were just looking at... Um, so, I have two copies right now of this book, The Birds of Florida. Uh, by Harold H. Bailey. Um, the one that is under the camera is the original proof that has the original watercolors that were done for the book. Um, so this is an actual watercolor painting uh, done by artist George Sutton for the book. Um, and then it actually is reproduced as a lithograph in the uh, the book that was made for sale. Um, this book is from 1925. And we were just looking at the entry for the Bob White and the Turkey. Uh, I did read a little about the Bob White. So how about in the center, um, center of this page we have the Florida turkey, family uh, Meliagridae, Meliagris Galapago Osceola, the wild turkey. While still in abundance, <coughs> pardon me, Rafi, thank you for the hundred bits. <laughs> While still an abundant bird in numerous sections of our state, drainage and fire are fast destroying their natural habitat, <coughs> the glade hammocks and pine timber. Along with their deer, the early settlers could always have their turkey dinner, but lucky, lucky is the sportsman now who can include one of these fine birds in his day's bag. During the winter, often two or more families of turkeys flock together. But as spring approaches, these flocks break up, and by April, and by April 10th, the hens are laying. <clears throat> they make their nest by scraping a hollow in the ground, in the dense palmetto scrub or hammock, and line it with dry grass, stems, pine needles, and leaves. Seven to twelve eggs are laid, and ground a rich, the ground a rich buff, speckled and spotted with reddish brown. The young follow the parents almost as soon as hatched and within a few weeks can fly a little and so get off the ground when necessary. 
Bobcats, raccoons, snakes, and other vermin take toll of their numbers, and with good roads and many gunmen out after them, and their habits being habitats being destroyed, they are rapidly being driven out and killed off. Their food consists of berries, seeds, and wild fruits, some insects and caterpillars, while beetles and grasshoppers are also taken extensively. I believe only one form Sorry, I believe only the one form is found in the state, though it is possible it overlaps with the northern form, Sylvestris, near the Georgia and Alabama borders. <clears throat> so I think we will look to turn to the next birds. Let's see which ones kind of strike our fancy here. Got that those are going to be pigeons. I'm not sure the best way to show them to you so that they're right side up and you can see most of the page. Well, that just made them upside down. But also, I think because of the size of the book, you're going to have to look at them sideways. I um, apologize for that, but this is the camera that I have. Um, <clears throat> I was looking for one. Oh, it should be near here. There's the woodpeckers. Yes. Um, so this is one of my favorites in the entire book. And that is because it includes the Carolina parakeet. So what page are we on? We are at page 80. So this is plate 44 in the published printed book. Um, it doesn't actually say in the one that's on camera, it doesn't give the plate numbers because it's literally just a watercolor. So not an actual metal plate. Um, I'm trying to find the entry on the parakeet. Plate 43, 43, 43, 44, 45. I know it talks about them, but I'm not sure where. Let me go back a few pages. The entries and the plates, uh, the illustrations don't actually line up perfectly. Ah, here we go. <coughs> Family Sidacidae, parrots and parakeets, etc. Carolina parakeet, number 382, C plate 44. So the pa Carolina parakeet is going to be the two birds up here. Um, they are a form of parrot, so unsurprising that they show up nice and uh, tropically colored. Oh, that's not the direction I wanted to scooch the book. Um, <coughs> the entry here, and this is an entry from 1925 about the Carolina parakeet. For several years, this, the only species of the parrot family found in the East, has been called an extinct bird, not only in Florida, but wherever formerly found. I am glad to say, however, that I have positive knowledge that there is still a small col colony in existence but I do not expect it to last long, especially after this fact is published. The last supposedly known flock in Florida was cleaned out some years ago, 1904, and if any have been secured since, the records have never been published or become known. 
I have met in my wanderings over this state several men who remember when they were as common as any bird here. And one man who shot for the, milita for the millinery trade years ago informed me he has had as high as 500 skins in his trunk and boxes at a time, for which he received the magnificent sum of 10 cents each. I have been told that during the early planting of citrus in Florida, the birds destroyed many oranges. But with the bountiful, bountiful supply of wild figs and other wild fruits and berries within our state, I do not believe that this new trait helped to cause their extinction. <clears throat> While many were shot by the early settlers, and no doubt the Indians killed many more, these numbers were so small that I believe other causes besides the hand of man had something to do with their elimination. <clears throat> but just what, I'm not prepared to say. Eggs laid by birds in captivity many years ago measure 1.31 inches by 1.06 inches and are pure white. They are supposed to have bred in holes in dead trees, but several old crackers I in, I've interviewed, um, and I'm assuming that that is the name of a trade, I'm not certain. <clears throat> It's in quotation marks, and in context, it sounds like a job, but I don't know what it's referring to. Uh, tell me that they make nests on branches of trees. We have really no actual records of nidification relating to this bird, which seems strange considering how abundant they were until about 1882. Until actual nesting sites are found, I'm inclined to believe that they nested in deserted woodpecker cavities. A most complete account of their breeding in captivity can be found in the Auk, volume 15, page 28. Auk is spelled A-U-K, and the Auk is an ornithological, um, like, scholarly publication. They were still fairly common in Broward County in 1895 and in St. Lucie County in 1899 when some 16 birds were secured in two days by parties hunting particularly for them. <clears throat> oh, no, no, definitely not the fault of people, just that they were hunted for their feathers to make ladies' hats um, and hunted so aggressively that they were made extinct. So. In the entry in the book, um, the author ba Bailey says that the Carolina parakeet was the only member of the Cidicei family in the East, which is inaccurate. <coughs> there are plenty of members of the Cidicei family that are native to South America. What makes the Carolina parakeet particularly unique is it was the only member of the Cidicei family, the parrot family, that was native to North America. And <clears throat> the settlers came and actually, oh, let me just, yeah, Rafe, let me just publish the location of these birds so that people can eradicate them. Um, so the Carolina parakeet is extinct. Uh, it was the only indigenous parakeet uh, parrot to North America. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Pardon me. I've been talking quite a bit and not drinking enough water. <coughs> and, <coughs> pardon me, as was referenced in the, the entry from 1925, um, they were often hunted for their feathers for the use in making hats. Um, so they were prized for feathers for hats, but also um, members of the citizen family, um, particularly budgies, um, which are native to Australia, uh, but also the Carolina parakeet, were, were hunted as meat for people to eat. Um, so they are extinct, and it's nice to see, like, um, they're illustrated here. They're also illustrated in um, Audubon's Guide to the Birds of North America. Um, so a, a number of the ornithologists from, like, the late 1800s and early 1900s 
had the Carolina parakeet represented in their works, um, but it is now an extinct species. And my particular interest in ornithology is in cytosine birds, uh, the parrot birds that are often people's pet birds. Um, and so today there are tons of uh, different members of the cytosine family that you'll find flocks of in Florida, but none of them are native to there. They're all the result of people's pet birds that either escaped or were released into the wild and thrived um, in the tropical environment there in Florida. <clears throat> These were actually native to North America. Um, let's see what else we can find here. Ooh, some lovely woodpeckers there. I'm actually going to show that image for a little bit, and then we might go back to plate 42, which is owls. Um, but I wanted to see, I pulled some other boxes and I want to see if there's anything in particular in these other boxes that would be good to show. Photos used by engravers. So there's some original photography for the Birds of Virginia book. Let me tell you about the uh, woodpeckers that are on the screen right now. All right, in this image, we have the pileated woodpecker female up here. We have the red-billed woodpecker. Here, it took me a moment because none of them in the picture actually have a red bill. Um, and then we have the pileated woodpecker male, the red-headed woodpecker, and the southern flicker. I'm going to read the entry on the red-billed woodpecker because I find it very interesting that it's called red-billed but has a black bill. Centurus carolinus. Abundantly distributed all over Florida, we find these birds, and countless are the insects destroyed each year by a pair of them, for they are year-round residents and non-migratory. They destroy some citrus fruit, and in southern Florida, mangoes, from which they secure the juice, but one half of 1% damage against 99.5% good makes them truly a beneficial bird. Winter and summer, they are constantly on the move from cabbage palm and other wild trees to coconuts, citrus, and shade trees of all varieties. Wild berries and seeds of cabbage and royal palm are also eaten in season, but their main supply of food consists of ants, spiders, grubs, larvae, and other minute forms of insect life procured from the limbs, trunks, and under the bark of trees. Four to six eggs, a glossy white, unmarked, are generally laid from April 15 to May 10. Nesting cavities range from four feet in dead cabbage palm stubs to 40 or more feet up in pine or other varieties of trees. Live royal and coconut palms are often damaged by these birds, and when their cavities are enlarged by the pileated woodpecker, the trees generally die. If dead royal and coconut palm stubs were left standing for them to breed in, I do not think this would occur so often. <laughs> so both providing facts, but also giving some opinion on 
um, how we should treat with the birds. Red bellied? Oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> Thank you, Wraith Fay. I was very confused. Um, but you are in indeed correct. It is red bellied, and I was just misreading the name. And it's this one here is the red bellied woodpecker. But yeah, I was I was misreading the name as build. Thank you for correcting me. Um, I'm going to move back to, pl to illustration 42. Because it's very pretty. <laughs> yeah, just a little, little, tiny, little red spot. Oh, can we do it? These pages are difficult to turn because these are actual watercolors pasted into a book. Um, owls. <laughs> We've got some owls here. Um, so, in this image, in the upper left, we have the long-eared owl, and below that is the Florida burrowing owl. I did not misread that one. It is the Florida burrowing owl. Uh, up here is the sawhet owl, the Florida barred owl, and the short-eared owl. I now want to know about this burrowing owl. Florida burrowing owl, number 378A. Spiotio, uh, Spiotito cunicularia floridiana, fl floridana, ground owl or snake owl. Throughout the center of our state, especially as far north as Kissimmee, this little owl is still abundant. One naturally associates them with prairie dogs and cattle, on account of the western states, but in the place of the prairie dogs we have the gopher turtles, Gopherus polyphemus, and the diamond-backed rattlesnake is at home in that territory also. Many people still believe that the owls live in harmony with the rattler in the same burrow, owing to the rattling noise made by the birds, both old and young, when in their nest hole. This is not true, and from my experience with both, I believe that if a rattler is hungry and goes into a burrowing owl's hole, he would eat both young or old birds if they were there. I have examined burrows occupied by owls that I thought were made by the owls themselves, and I have seen others that I think were originally gopher holes and appropriated by the owls. These burrows extend quite a distance underground, often seven or eight feet, at the end of which the owls deposit their five to eight pure white eggs. These are laid during the latter part of March and through April. I have taken young just hatched at Okeechobee on May 6th. The burrowing owl lives chiefly on insects, and stomach contents of numbers I've examined were filled with insect matter entirely. Specimens taken on the Lower East Coast, Dade and Monroe counties, differ so from the, inferior, from the interior form that it may be advisable at some future date to separate them into another form. So they are literally burrowing owls. I did not know that there were burrowing owls, Kira. I am fascinated and amazed and so, so happy to find out about burrowing owls. <laughs> um, this is only one of two pages of owls. There's a whole second watercolor of just owls. This one features four owls. 
that are the Florida screech owl, red phase, the barn owl, the Florida screech owl, gray phase, and the great horned owl. The great horned owl, I will say, is most likely a very recognizable owl to most people. Um, there also appears to be a dead bird down in the bottom under the great horned owl. Actually, in its claws, there is some sort of, it looks to me like a seabird, but I would have to, I would have to do some um, investigation to find out what kind of bird this is, this blue bird with the red and yellow bill. But just based on the shape of the bird, its bill, its size, the size of its wings, I'm, it looks to me like it's probably a seabird. Yes, yes, Hannah, it is a great horned owl. I do think it is Snackies, yes. <laughs> um, the great horned owl is big. Uh, number 375. Abubo virginianus virginianus, chicken owl. That is another name, apparently, for the great horned owl. Looks like a purple gallinule. Thank you, Rafe. I'm not familiar with a purple gallinule, but I will take your word for it. Um... Poultry raisers of the state fear this large owl, and rightly so, for he does take many chickens, even up to the size of a full-grown hen. Due to the lack of cold weather, many people allow their poultry to roost in the nearby trees from which the big owl proceeds to select his prey. Of course, they, they do not live entirely on poultry, for out in the wilds they secure rabbits, both old and young, and many of the larger birds, especially those that nest and roost in colonies. For a home, they select, as a rule, a natural tree cavity or deserted hawk, crow, or eagle nest. And sometimes I have known them to drive the eagles away from their freshly built up nest. During the latter part of November and early December, they deposit their two, rarely three, eggs. The young remain on this nest until nearly full grown and feathered. But by March 1st, they are able to leave the nest, though still being fed at nighttime by the parents. The eggs are pure white, unspotted, but soon become nest-stained. No bird enjoys chasing or worrying this owl more than does the crow. And it is a rather amusing sight to see one so harassed. <laughs> I'm going to check another box, see if it's something that I want to show. Deer. Mm. Some framed photographs. I think we're having more fun with the illustrated book. <coughs> There's lots of oversized images there, but I think we're having more fun with this, this book. So the great horned, the barn, and the barred owl are all ones you can see in Iowa, too. According to the Department of Natural Resources, the barn owl is in in endangered in the state. Thank you, Hannah. Wraith, I see your hydrate. And I definitely should have backed up further from the book and will do so in the future. Because that was much too close to have that water. Burp. Yes, Geek Outs. <laughs> How are you? Um, here, of course, we have eagles. Let's see. So we have the adult bald eagle. We have the osprey or fish hawk, Harlan's hawk. A two year old bald eagle, a one year old bald eagle, and a red tailed hawk, J. 
juvenile. Um, I wish I could. I wish I could turn this so that it was up upright for you, but um, I can't and get the entire page in. So you've got sideways birds, and I apologize for that. Um, they are indeed watercolor paintings of the birds. Um, so the book itself, this is the Birds of Florida. <coughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty dinosaurs, yes. Um, we'll just switch back here so I can show you. The book itself, The Birds of Florida, from 1925. This is Harold H. Bailey's work. The art is not Bailey. The art is um, George Mick Sutton, George M. Sutton. Um, this is the proof. This book is not the published version. This is the proof of the book. And it includes the actual original watercolors that were used to put together the proof. This is the published version, which is much, much smaller and has lithographs in it of the watercolors. Um, But we have the original, with the watercolors in it, we have uh, copper printing plates. We have an, a number of things that came with this manuscript collection um, for both the Birds of Virginia and the Birds of Florida. So we'll just switch back over here. I will read the entry on the bald eagle, and then it's going to be time to start closing out the stream, because we are getting toward the end of our time. I just am looking for this bald eagle entry. <sighs> Sparrowhawks, duck hawk, pigeon hawk, bald eagle. Number 352. Uh, Haliatus leucocephala. Uh, no? Haliatus leucocephalus leucocephalus. Fish eagle, white head, white headed eagle. Though adopted for our national emblem and always referred to as a noble bird, yet resorting to the underhanded methods of taking fish from the osprey or acting as a scavenger along our beaches, he seldom lives up to our traditions and he never protects his home. To be sure he may occasionally catch a coot, wounded duck, or sometimes a goose, but not often. And I have and I have often regretted that the forefather who selected him, him as our national emblem did not discover the golden eagle first. We find, them still in a, we find them still quite abundant in Florida, especially near water, and very numerous adjacent to salt water. Tourists may see one as they drive along our highway, circling above or sitting on some dead tree eating a fish, or standing on the bank of some watercourse watching for a fish hawk, osprey, to procure a meal from him or for him. After the third year of age, they attain the white head and tail, and the young, the first year especially, look almost black, and are often referred to as black eagles, and are thought to be a separate species. Their nests are huge affairs of sticks, trash, sea and bay grass, lined with dry grass or seaweed. They select the largest tree they can find, often from 30 to 100 feet or more up. Two, rarely three eggs are laid, November 15th to January 1st, a dull white unmarked. The young are pure white when hatched and remain in the nest until fully grown, or until fully grown and feathered, which takes about three months. I have climbed to nests holding nearly full-grown young, half-grown, and even two- and three-day-old chicks, yet the old birds never offered to come near the nest in defense. <laughs> yeah, Bailey clearly does not like the bald eagle. 
I've I've seen one in person um, shortly before I moved away from Minnesota. Uh, we were visiting the um, memorial for the I thirty five W bridge, uh, and there was a bald eagle um, that was sitting on a tree out near the the river. Um, near where the memorial was for the bridge that collapsed. The golden eagle's win wingspan is scary. Not as scary as the California condor, though. Yeah. I don't know which page the golden eagle is on. I think... Is, it, is that the golden eagle? Page 72 of the book. Yep, so this is the Golden Eagle. Um, many persons confuse the young of the bald eagle, which is blackish in color the first year, with the Golden Eagle, but they are easily distinguished at close range because the Golden Eagle has the lower legs feathered below the knee and all the way down to the foot. The birds do not breed in our state, and records of those that have straggled to our boundaries and where the birds have been killed and positively, positively identified are uncommon. Those taken in Florida have no doubt come down from the southern Alleghenies, where a few still breed or may have wandered far from their home in the western states, though I am inclined to believe that they come more often from the lower North Carolina. Allegheny, uh, sorry, from the lower North Carolina Allegheny Mountains, where I have seen nests and counted as high as six birds in the air at a time. Records of their capture in the western area of Florida are quite numerous, three occurring in the vicinity of Defuniac Springs during 1908, 1909, and 1910. Uh, see Oc, volume 27, pages 80 to 206. Their food consists of live squirrels, rabbits, groundhogs, ducks, geese, and other varieties of birds and mammals. These birds seldom resort to dead fish or carrion, as does the bald eagle. For this reason alone, the golden eagle should have been our national emblem in preference to the bird chosen. <laughs> so Bailey definitely thinks the golden eagle and not the bald eagle should be our national bird. Um, oh, Hannah, you live about a mile from a river, so you get to see a lot of bald eagles in the winter. They follow the geese and tend to nest near the river. Yeah, I've seen them, I've only seen them near a river, but, uh, so that is unfortunately all of the time that I have today for the Bailey Law Collection. Um, I will be back next week either with more from the Bailey Law Collection or with another um, ornithology or oology related collection. Um, I want to thank everybody who dropped in and hung out with me for this exploration. Um, and especially, uh, I'm typing, uh, trying to see who we're going to raid. Um, and uh, especially 16-Bit Eric for bringing over the whimsies. Um, I d very much appreciate that. Um, it does not look like Monterey Bay Aquarium is currently streaming, nor is North Carolina State University Libraries. So you know what? We are going to go and we are going to raid Stephen Kill, um, who is a wonderful streamer, uh, lives in... Edinburgh, Scotland, um, absolutely wonderful community, and um, he's currently playing Pokemon Snap. Which, you know, Pokemon, taking pictures of Pokemon, very similar to ornithological work. So that's going to be my through line there. Uh, thank you all for stopping by. I hope I see you again in the future for another Archival Adventures. Uh, Wednesdays here, 
um, either at VTUL Studios channel or Rogan 27 from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. where we explore items from the archives at Virginia Tech. Um, again, thank you all for stopping by. We will be raiding over to Stephen Kill very shortly. Bye. <laughs>